Welcome in to the 212th episode of the Young Terps podcast from the Viner Fourgate studio. We got a full show talking about the Terps 27-13 win over Michigan State on Saturday. And of course, we'll kick it off with the non-rev report. And joining me for that is my man, Todd Carton. Todd, uh, somewhat of a rough week for some of the teams that we're going to talk about. Yeah, it really was, uh, Mason. I'm happy to be with you here on a rainy Monday afternoon. But, uh, yeah, um, the teams that I guess you would expect to struggle struggled, and the teams that you'd expect to be successful were successful. Well, let's start it off with uh, the team that had a tough slate going into the week, and we weren't too high on them going into these two games. The women's soccer team, they dropped a pair of games, including uh, getting clobbered by Michigan State. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that uh, what happened at at home on Sunday against Michigan State is just sort of a hangover from a very difficult road trip that started last week when they had to go to the number then number 4 Rutgers where they played a terrific game and lost one to nothing. Then they had to go to Wisconsin. Uh they actually led Wisconsin one to nothing at the half, uh, gave up two second half goals, uh one on a set play that they've had trouble defending. And uh, then one on a goal that was just a terrific goal, the kind that you see from teams that play a lot together. And then they had to come back three days later and play Michigan State at home. And, and I'm hoping maybe they were just a little worn out and the weather was bad and uh, they were just completely flat, losing four to nothing. Yeah, the Terps are now one in four in the Big Ten. They've lost four straight games, now two, five and five. On the year, they have a week to regroup before they host Penn State, who, Todd, according to your notes, is one of the best teams in the conference. Yeah, they, they sure are. And and that was another thing that Michigan State came in. I think they beat Penn State. They gave them their first loss. So Michigan State came in with a lot of confidence and on a high. But uh, in RPI, I think the last time I looked, Penn State was about number six in uh, women's soccer. So they've played a challenging schedule. They've been really successful. And Penn State and Rutgers, at Wisconsin, are probably the class of the league right now. Keeping things at Ludwig Field uh, on the men's side, the Terps play one game this week uh, on a cold Friday night, and they win one to nothing over Old Dominion on a penalty kick goal. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, another one of those situations. A player clearly got taken down in the box, and um, Malcolm Johnson, who has been the go-to guy this year from the penalty spot, has stepped up again and just kind of buried one into the uh, high uh, upper left corner. And uh, Jamie Lowell, who has been starting in goal for an injured Nicholas Neumann, was just off the charts, picked up his second straight, a uh, clean sheet, which is terrific for him. And he just he just made some out-of-this-world saves Friday night. I had to watch that game because I was at volleyball, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I just chose to be inside rather than sitting outside in a cold rain. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you for that one. Is there um, controversy uh, between the pipes for the men's soccer team? I don't know. We'll have to see where that goes, Mason. You know, I mean, Neumann has been injured, but Lowell, I think that, that Sasho came into the season feeling like he had two starters in goal, and Lowell has certainly uh, really stepped up and been more than capable. As I said, he's put together back-to-back -to -back clean sheets. So, uh, you know, we'll see how, he, how Neumann comes along. It, what it does is it lets Sasho – he doesn't feel like he has to rush Neumann back when you've got a guy that can play at that level. Yeah, the Terps will hit the road this week, Tuesday night game at Rutgers, which can be seen on the Big Ten Network in a Sunday afternoon tilt with Northwestern. Record for the team is at 6-1-2, and two, and they're 2-0-1 two, oh, and one in the conference. And Todd, Terps, uh, I, I'm really starting to like this team. I think they can make a run this year uh, at another national championship. Yeah, you know, uh, it, these things play out so strangely sometimes, some years, Mason. I mean, they look like a very solid team. They have, as Sasha always does, played a very challenging schedule. They played some really good teams. They played at home. They've gone on the road, played at Georgetown. They, you know, so they, they played Denver. You know, so they played some really quality teams, and they're coming through that 
really quite well. Um, I think the game against Penn State was a little bit of an outlier, that 3-3 game. They're solid defensively, and they're developing some cohesion on the offensive end. But we'll see. You know, I, as I say, I remember the last year time that, that Maryland won the national championship. They started the season, and I think they didn't score for the first five and a half games or something like that. And then they hit the NCAA tournament and shut everybody out for the entire tournament. So <laughs> you just never know how these things are going to roll out when you get to the end. No, you don't. And, and you're right to call that one out. Um, they've had some times where I think we've all thought they're going to make a deep run, and they drop uh... – second round home game to a UMBC. So I think, yeah, you, you really don't know what, what soccer. It's about who gets hot at the end of the season. Over to the pavilion at Xfinity Center uh, where the volleyball team went 0-2 this week. Todd, they drop one on the Big Ten Network Friday night to Michigan State, and then uh, number three, Nebraska, comes through in front of a great crowd, but they take it uh, three sets to one. Yeah. Um, first, first, let me give a shout out to my UMBC retrievers, since I am an alum there in that second round game. And of course, we all know about their basketball glory. But uh, to get back to volleyball, um, Friday night was a was really kind of disappointing. They came out flat early and the, as they have been doing and and fell behind one set to nothing. They they kind of alternated sets and they ran out to a nice lead, a good solid lead in the fifth set, which is only played to 15. They had an eight to five lead. And then I don't know what happened. I watched it. I can't figure out. They stopped talking what happened to them and that they gave up 10 straight points and wound up losing that uh, set 15 to eight. They came back Sunday playing the number three team in the country and other than the first set, again, another slow start. Well, it wasn't really a f slow start because Maryland jumped out to a 7-2 lead and then Nebraska kind of found their footing. Um, but the other sets were very, very competitive. And the third set win, Maryland won the third set 25-21. And it's only the second time Maryland has even won a set against Nebraska since we've joined the Big Ten. Wow. And, yeah, I got to agree with you. A, a couple great shots of you on Friday night. Uh, there behind the uh, turfs on Big Ten. Yeah, Network. people. I, I I have to say I got several texts during the game about my hat. I I guess I picked out a good hat to wear that night. Hey, including one for me. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, but you know, I mean, look, the turfs. If if drawing filling the pavilion is a measure of success, then they're having a little bit of success at home. They had. 1500 Friday night for Michigan State and 2100 plus for uh, Nebraska on Sunday. So two huge crowds. I mean, and and frankly, I I felt like that match on Sunday showed what I thought Maryland could have been for the entire year. Now, whether they found themselves found themselves enough uh, to salvage the season, I don't know. But if they can maintain this level of play over the remainder of the season, they might give themselves an outside shot at an NCAA bid. Yeah, and it's not looking great right now. The Terps are 0-4 in the conference and 9-7 and overall. And just not the year that uh, the Terps were hoping for uh, after what was a somewhat inspiring season last year. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see. Uh, they they host Indiana Friday night. So, I mean, Illinois, excuse me. They host Illinois Friday night and then they go to Rutgers on Sunday. And again, Illinois, as I talked last week when they had that first loss out there, not a great Illinois team this year. Certainly one that Maryland could beat if they, again, if they come out and play well. And then if they beat Rutgers and they get to two and four and get some confidence, you know, confident te athletic teams, as you know, Mason, from your days playing lacrosse, you know, your team gets a little confident. A team that knows they can win some games is a harder team to beat. Yeah, it certainly is. And we saved the best for last, Todd, and it was a great week for the Terps. Uh, in field hockey, they win a pair of road games, 2-1 to one in overtime at number three, Iowa, and a win over the number two team in the country, Northwestern. And they do so without their leading goal scorer, Hope Rose. Yeah, I mean, pretty, pretty astonishing. I mean, you, you know, Missy really shortened her bench, I think. I think she only used three subs in the Iowa game, which really put the Terps to the test when they had to go from Iowa to Evanston and play on the road again on Sunday against a top-ranked team and a defending national champ. Uh, 
But the, the player who I thought at, when I saw in the, the exhibition game, uh, Danielle von Rensselaer from Rensselaer, I should say, let me get her name right, uh, for, who transferred in from Brown as a grad grad transfer, scored all four goals for Maryland this weekend. And I thought she, seeing her in that exhibition, I said, that this is a difference maker. I thought if she had been on the team last year, which was a final four team, I think it would have she would have pushed them over the top. Yeah, and the Terps, um, they're just so impressive, and these two wins uh, were very, very impressive. And starting to make that case that uh, we might see a number one next to Maryland's name in the poll soon. Uh, it's possible. Right now, I think uh, North Carolina is still the uh, un only undefeated team in the country. They've been playing really at a very high level. I'm guessing that Maryland will pick up some votes this week. Uh, but I don't see them moving much higher than number two. Uh, but their defense is great. And then the Big Ten today announced, uh, I should say, that uh, a big get out the broom for the player of the week in field hockey in in the Big Ten. Uh, Danny Von, Von Rensselaer was the offensive player of the week. Rain Wright, who was just it, – it's, it's hard to watch defensive players sometimes, but this is a special defensive player for Maryland. Uh, and she was the defensive player of the week. And Sophie Klautz, another woman from the Netherlands, won her second freshman of the week award. And the Terps will roll on uh, now at 5-0 and in the conference. They have home games uh, this week against Indiana and Rutgers and a challenging uh, road match. At, again, the number six team in the country, Penn State. Um, but they're off until Friday when they'll host uh, Indiana. Right. Uh, they may have a game uh, in between uh, an, an out of non conference game. I don't have the schedule memorized in between Indiana and Rutgers, but those are the, the three conference games left are Indiana and Rutgers, which are at home, and then Penn State on the road. So Maryland. Uh, of the top four teams in the in the conference, Maryland gets to play all three of them on the road this year. Yeah, and that was a mistake on, on my part. Those are the three conference games they have left, but they're off until Friday when they host uh, Indiana at the field hockey and lacrosse complex. And uh, it seems like they're they're on one of those runs, Todd, where everything the Big Ten title is probably just a it's a really impressive check mark, but a check mark, and the thing that they're really chasing is that national championship. Uh, absolutely. I know I know from talking with Missy a couple of times, just kind of casually that, you know, she feels like it's been too long since Maryland's brought home that big trophy. And despite the fact that they've been in the final four, three of the last four years, I think three of the last or at least twice in the last four years, uh, she wants to bring home that trophy. And it's been since I think 2011 was the last national championship. And that wraps up the non revs for the week. But Todd, cool experience for you on Saturday uh, one of your friends uses their uh, Terrapin Club backstage pass to get you out on the field. How was how was the experience? Yeah, it was it was interesting, Mason. You know, it's very very controlled. Um, got to see a lot of the recruits come by because it was a big recruiting uh, weekend for for Coach Loxley. But you know, they're 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 sort of guarded. Don't talk to the recruits. Don't talk to their parents. <laughs> you know, but you know, you get to see the players, but you can't really go on the field. You go on the the, the uh, concrete behind the benches and you know there were a couple of guys that I saw that I was able to sort of just say hello to that I see them around at other sporting events with the big one being for me at uh, Chad Ryland because you know uh, right now you can't spell Maryland without Ryland I don't think you can ever spell it without Ryland that's true but the, especially this year for the Terps for Terps football uh, you know and and so it's an interesting experience. It gives you an interesting perspective on sort of how big those guys really are when you, as opposed to sitting in, in the suite where I do, and they, they don't look quite as big as they really are. Some of those guys, some aren't, but man, the linemen, some of the linemen are just huge. And it was good that, you know, there were some basketball recruits. There were some volleyball recruits on the uh, on the field that, that, at that time. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting experience. Yeah, it certainly is, and and one that's um, a good perk of being part of the Terrapin Club. Absolutely. Other than that, what'd you think of the Terps uh, and the win over Michigan State? You know, I I, I was talking with Bruce uh, for his show, and and I said I I think what impressed me the most is is 
sort of the heart that the team showed in coming back after the ridiculous penalty on Trader's interception that became a non-interception, or the penalty that wasn't a penalty, that could take a lot of the air out of out of a team, and they come back and they get a blocked field goal. And then the other sudden turnaround when they couldn't score on the four plays from the two-yard line, and that can give a, a team like Michigan State a lot of momentum. And the defense came out and just shut down Michigan State. And, and to keep your poise and keep your focus under those circumstances, I, says, I think says a lot about where the team is headed. Yes, it does, and hopefully – a better crowd and some better weather this weekend as the Terps host Purdue. And, Todd, I'll see you out there. All right. Looking forward to it, Mason. From what I hear, this game actually against Purdue has the biggest pre-sale of any of the games so far this year. So hopefully that we will get a better crowd. It does as of right now, and it can be tracked on um, MarylandWillWin.com. They actually built an API into uh, the UM Terps ticket sales uh, they have it at about 39,000 tickets sold as of 4 o'clock today. So looking definitely at the biggest crowd. And, Todd, thanks for joining. Oh, always a pleasure, Mason. Now let's swing over to football. And, as always, Wayne Viner from Terp Talk joins us. Terps 27, Michigan State 13. Uh, Wayne, what would you see up there? I, I saw some good things. And most of the good things were from the Terps. I saw some bad things from the refs. I saw a really frustrated Michigan State team and some actual Big Ten dominant running football from Maryland at times. Overall, I liked what I saw. And I saw my first game ever at SECU Stadium. How about you? Yeah, I was the first time seeing the queue at CQ Stadium. Ooh. Oh, yeah. That was awful. I can't believe I just said that. Um <laughs> Yeah, for me, a uh, solid game for Maryland, like I said on our post-game show, which you can see on YouTube for more of the instant reactions. Um, after some time, it was a game that Maryland just won. They could have won by more. They could have won by seven less. They just won the game. There wasn't much of a threat for Michigan State at the end. And, boy, there got to be some Spartan fans out there kicking themselves for paying Mel Tucker all that money. And I've, some of those people have responded to us on YouTube or some of the other formats that they're really disappointed they need to fire the coach. When you spend $90 million on a coach, which takes about every penny you have to get that contract, and then you immediately go from an that was 11-win season now to what looks like to be a bit of a disaster, yeah, there's some people really upset. Yeah, I, it's, it's not good. Not mm -hmm. good up in East Lansing. And it's I just I can't see that team really winning – many games they have ohio state this week which is going to be real ugly for them uh, obviously they still have to play michigan they still have to play penn state things are not not looking too bright for uh the spartans going ahead but when you're looking at, at a small group of teams maryland indiana rutgers michigan state michigan penn state and ohio state somebody in here has to has to go down while somebody else comes up it just happens to be Maryland's time, I think, to step up a little bit, and it's going to take beating Michigan State, beating Indiana, beating Rutgers, and then winning one of these other games to actually make it a magical season in College Park. It's doable. This it is, and that kind of gets going in a game that we'll talk about coming up this week at CQ Stadium. The Terps will take on Purdue. But the um, not done talking about what happened last week on the field – uh, quick overview, first downs, Maryland 24, Michigan State 22. Terps on third down go 8 for 17. Michigan State goes 50%, 7 for 14. Uh, fourth down, Maryland converts 2 out of 3. The third one being that stop on the one-yard line against Antoine Littleton, which was an ugly moment for Maryland in the game. Michigan State 0 for 1. Terps run the ball for 175. Michigan State 100 even. Uh, Leah throws the ball for 314 yards for Maryland. Michigan State 221. And the Terps punt the ball three times in the game. Michigan State punts at five. And that really, for once, doesn't tell much of the story, I don't think. It, it doesn't. One of the things, Michigan State, trouble with the field goal kicking game. They miss a field goal early. They get the block. Maryland gets the block by Jacorian Bennett. Doesn't really make up for that bad call on what should have been a Dante Trader interception for a touchdown. But it was, it was a good moment there, seeing the Terps not fold. 
after things don't go their way. Bennett comes back and blocks the kick, ends the half. Uh, would have been more poetic justice had he blocked the kick, scooped and scored. And then you could have all be saying, oh, the ball doesn't lie, the ball doesn't lie. But in this case, and the, the refs blew that call, I, you can't complain too much because Maryland still wins the game. But if you go back a week or so ago, two interceptions that didn't happen, that don't get reviewed, uh, an interception for a touchdown where you get a penalty that's non-reviewable, and you start to wonder, as Mike Loxley would say, what's it going to take for little old Maryland to get some respect here in the Big Ten? What's it going to take, Mason? I have no idea. I don't think it's going to take anything that, that can be obtained by without changing the last 150 years of football history. Um, yeah, that play was bad. That that Dante Trader interception, that was a bad, bad call. And, you know, not, now I have to go on an old man rant. Well, before you get to your rant, of course the penalty's called on number six again. Not Jay Sean Jones this time, but your Jacksonville dude, Corey, Corey Coley. Coley. Yeah. yeah, so number six and penalties down the field for hitting too hard. It's a Maryland tradition. Now you can rant. Yeah, I just, I, I got to say, I hate the phrase, ball don't lie. Like, Maryland's tweeting that after they blocked that kick. Wh- why? The ball does lie. The, if the ref calls the call, it took away the points. Like, maybe the ball doesn't lie, but the people uh, administering the playing of said ball do lie. And that's my three-second rant for now. Well, also, in uh, other Maryland Twitter news, the Terps get a shout-out today from, of all people, DJ Khaled. I saw that, but I didn't see what the actual shout-out was. What was it? I don't know. It was just DJ Khaled being DJ Khaled, for for those of you who know who DJ Khaled is. He's I thought like it a, was a Michigan dude and a Nike dude. What's he doing shouting out Maryland? I, I guess so. I, I called um, Jordan after that because Jordan thinks DJ Khaled's the funniest idiot in the world. <laughs> and... I was like, I guess he might know Tua because he's a Miami guy. And so he's watching Leah play, I-, I guess. I don't know. He was saying, like, how God's on Maryland's side, like they're Notre Dame or so- something like that. It was kind of ridiculous. It was very ridiculous. But that that's just something you don't see every day, DJ Khaled shouting out uh, Maryland football. You, you know, I'm going to say it has something to do with Loxley because Loxley knows everybody. You brought that up. Like, how does this guy know so many people? Dude knows everybody. I got to guess that the NFL players that he's brought to these schools really lo- – I mean, they do. They really love Coach Locks, and, and they bring all these people around, and Locks does a great job of staying in touch with his players after they're gone. But back to the game, um, there's just something off with Maryland's passing game. Passing game's good in the medium, not so good deep, almost to the point that Maryland's just not throwing the ball deep down the middle anymore. Uh, the one play comes to mind, an overthrow of, I think it was a wide open for Kim Jarrett. Yep. Where Leah just airmailed that. And when you look down a stat line, you say, well, yeah, there's a pass complete for 44 yards. Oh, it was the tight end. Okay. Next longest pass, 26 yards. Oh, it went to the tight end. You start to wonder what happened in the deep passing game. I thought it would come back when you hand the ball off 19 times to the little bus there, or the baby bus, Antoine Littleton, seven times to Hemby and it becomes an effective run that you have to commit safeties to, that, of course, that's going to open up the deep passing game. Something's not right. Don't know what it is. Leo looked really mobile for wearing a big knee brace and having rib problems. And he actually ran with some purpose, which is different than the first few games. He actually had some where, plays where he went to fake the ball to the tailback, and then he takes off with great purpose and gains some yards. So I... I but back to what you said. Don't know where the deep passing game is. Love to have it back. Yeah, with the guys they have, specifically Jacob Copeland, who I feel like is the guy who's not getting the ball enough in this offense, um, you would like to see them get really get vertical and just throw some, throw some 50-50 balls. Even though they're moving the ball well, um, you would just really like to see, see that become a threat. Make it something you have to pay attention to when you're playing against Maryland. You have to worry about them with the big chunk plays, but now it just seems like uh, almost a well-run team that just doesn't really need a quarterback that can do everything. They have a quarterback that's very, very skilled in reading uh, pre-snap, but gets kind of locked onto that, and it, it almost makes you happy that this offense might have some really, really great talent on it, but it looks like it could be run at a fairly decent level by 
the guys they have coming up that are going to take over some of these roles. Oh, just throw Billy Edwards' name in there. I, would, I thought we were going to see him a little bit. Did not see him at all on Saturday. One of the good things about these eight, nine, ten play drives, running the ball for three and a half to four yards and then doing it again, is it keeps your defense off the field. So my my the the offense as it's being run right now is probably a really good pace for the defense. Yeah, there were a lot of first downs by Michigan State, but in the second half, the defense deep into the rotation. Yes, we cover this in the postgame show, but it's noteworthy to me to bring it up again. The first line guys, Finau, Mokite, okay, they're pretty good. Second uh, line, which is the Tank Booker line with Chibuzi, mm-hmm. they're they're okay. They they get a lot of run, and then you see the third line come in with Krishan Fuller, and you see Tyche Johnson come in the middle, and you know, oh my goodness, against Michigan State, they actually were impactful. Yeah, it, and. It, I think at this point the pairing is starting to become year over year. A guy like Quayshon Fuller, he's got another year. Uh, Taichi Johnson and Tommy Inkenbisote are playing together. Uh, right, yep. Um, those guys came in the same class. It's where they don't have that next guy, where they're really going to be st- stuck after this year, is on one side, Austin Fontaine and uh, Darrell Chime are on the two deep. Those guys are both gone after this year. On the other side, it's Tyler Baylor and Vandarius Cowan. All those guys are gone. Nobody has stepped up to be a real edge rusher. And, you know, for those of you that watch a lot of NFL football, the game's really won at a high level on the edge. My edge guy can make an impact, and I have decent guys in the middle. We're fine. If we got great guys in the middle and we have nothing off the edge, you're kind of screwed. Okay. Well, you brought up the balance on defense. I don't know if it was a postgame show or, or on this show. You said it, you need the edge rusher, you need a middle linebacker. If you can get an edge rusher and a middle linebacker of note, you're going to be okay. And Maryland really, you know, Bar, Barham is becoming that guy, but he's not a big guy. He's not your, he's not London Fletcher. He's not Ray Lewis. He's not a guy. Not yet. I don't know if his body type plays to that. They need, they, you need to get Hippolyte back, A. And B, you need a real stud middle well, linebacker. You need Alex Wujak back. Yeah. I mean, if you think about what this team was designed to do, and you look at this year, you would be kicking yourself like crazy. You look at the guys that have walked out the door, and I hate to bring this up, but Chop Robinson, Darrell Jackson, Terrence Lewis, and Brandon Jennings, and suddenly Maryland's like a top-10 team this year. Legitimately, hmm. five-star middle linebacker, four-star middle linebacker was playing great. Two guys – who weren't great off the edge, but they're probably better than what's out there now. And this team's in a completely different class with those guys there. But that's that's college football right now. And Chop's, Chop's not really doing anything, despite the PFF things. He's not even really getting on the field that much at Penn State. And I have not heard anything about Darrell Jackson. I mean, you start to look at it, and you're like, yeah, if these guys were here, maybe it would be different. But If they were really good, and I'm not just saying this to be pro-Maryland, a lot of these transfers – one of the reasons they leave is they don't get feel they get the, the attention that they deserve on the teams they go to when they're young. None of these guys have really made an impact anyplace else. It's not like... No, two of them aren't really even playing. Right. So there might be reasons why they're not here, but I get your point that had they stayed here and if they were decent and lived up to the billing, they'd be stars on a team that, that might be 5-0 and at this point. That They were difference makers. When you go out recruiting and trying to close out the next class or get the next set of transfers, you've got a lot to sell still. You've got almost starting. If you can get a rush end, the guy's going to compete to actually start in the Big Ten for a team that looks like it's going to be pretty good. It's going to be interesting to talk about what next year looks like because you brought up those guys leaving. Half of the offensive line's gone. Liam might be in the pros. Jarrett might leave. Demas is out of eligibility. There's a lot of guys that are leaving. Chad Ryland, the kicker, who's been spectacular. He had one year with us. There's going to be a lot of replacing to do. If it's going to be a magical year, it's got to be this year. It's not going to be next year. Yeah, and a couple more points on the game before we talk about next week. Um, Antoine Littleton's a real star for Maryland. Um, 
If you He's haven't got the seen personality. Him, check him out. He's up on Turp Talk and our YouTube channel, the, the post game. The whole 10 minutes we spent with him after the game. Yeah, great job um, by Little Tin. And great job by the coaching staff on giving a guy the ball 19 times. We haven't seen that at all this year. I mean, Hemby had a great first week, but he got the ball 13 times or 12 or whatever it was. Might have been nine. I, I don't remember. It's like nine for 120-something. Yeah, and I, I've been saying – if we got a guy that can run the ball 20 times a game, given four of these carries were in, like, one series on the one-yard line. Within two Five minutes. Five of them, actually, because yeah. he ran the ball for 60-whatever yards. 68 or, or 63 to get to the two. Yeah, and then, and then He was sort of out of gas. But he can run the ball between the tackles. He, he can take that. He's looking for that punishment. I talked to him about the difference, the psychological difference between being a linebacker and a guy who runs guys over, and, and he didn't see any particular difference between the two. I, I, I love that. He averages 6.3 yards per carry. He scores again, six straight game with a touchdown. At this point, he's just a bad man. I mean, he, he's like the guy that you're lining up on the other side, and I'm like, uh, well, damn, I don't want to have to tackle this guy 19 no. times today. No, and it should be. You could see a point where it gets to 25 times. The last time I've seen a guy at that size with the speed like that you go back to your Rick Badanics, guys who scored 20 touchdowns in a year. Uh, Maryland used to have guys like that. They got lighter and faster, but I love having that guy. You know, if D.J. Adams was used more, you might say it reminds you of D.J. Adams, but we went through the whole free D.J. Adams thing with Randy Etzel. He had to go back and find him. So I brought up some, some old stuff. You brought up some old stuff during the game when we walked out of there. Uh, we were walking back to the car, and you went, Wow. Rock and roll part two really changes the atmosphere here. Yeah. One, we got to get some fans. Can can, we, can Maryland find a way to, like, buy fake people to go to the game? Can we bring can, the cutouts back? Can we can we do anything <laughs> to um, possibly paint the seats red? I saw that one online today. Yeah. Paint the benches red. It would look a lot better on TV. I think that would be a disaster because knowing Maryland, they would end up getting beaten up and half silver and half red, and then they would be half silver and half red. Um 30,559, I think, was the number. It was raining. It's in the D.C. Oh, metro geez. area. Um, I, I don't know. People don't come out. People don't go to games anymore. I, I How really many? Think that we that's went a... to see the, just because it was here, we went to see the Ravens yesterday. There were empty seats. I know it was raining. There were people who paid $100 for a ticket. I didn't see them in the seat in Baltimore. I think all the tickets were sold. The people just didn't show up. It's not even do you buy a ticket. Now we got people buying tickets and going, oh, the weather's not so good. I'm not going to the game. Yeah, I mean, between the 50s, for those of you who went to the game or saw it on TV. Wh- wh- which game are you talking about? Maryland. Okay. Um, there's the chairback seats for the season ticket holders. They're empty. And you know what? That almost makes more sense. If I came here and I went to Maryland or I was a Maryland fan and this is the one game I can make it to this year, yeah, I'll tough it out in the rain. If I got tickets to the other seven home games they're playing or the other six – without this one involved, I might say, you know what, maybe not this week. I'm not going out there. It's the first time it's been 40-something and raining this year. It's The weather sucked. It still sucks today. I, I was excited, by the way. That's Big Ten football weather there. Yeah, that, That's Antoine but, Littleton, 20 carries a game weather but we're there. But we between the press box and our seats um, – at the 200 level that have the overhang on it. We're not getting – the rain does not dump okay, on – Okay, don't, uh, don't give all the secrets away, but yeah. yeah. Th- the rain is not hey, coming down on us. No, it didn't. We were on the field, but it wasn't raining for our – we spent an hour down on the field and then part of the fourth quarter. It was raining a little bit. But, hey, when it wins, when the game wins, when the whole atmosphere starts to feel like you're winning and it's starting to feel that way, it's different. You're okay getting a little wet for that. And – Back to the actual thing that you said, Rock and Roll Part 2 makes going to a Maryland game a lot more fun. It's something that I think they've actually been looking for for years that engages the entire stadium. Yes, our chant is not go white, go green. It's, hey, you suck, and we're going to beat the hell out of you. But that's this area. That's what. That's Maryland. That's New Jersey, Maryland. That's, that's who we are. And I think... I think maybe we're finally tired of uh, hiding from that, other than the fact that our real football jerseys are out there. But you, you know, can't wear them. Come midnight last night, we're back to this. Uh, just another M, just another giant M, just a little oh. piece of Maryland flag under it. Okay, so 
you and I are aware, but we don't know, I'll use the air quotes, don't really know what this contract with Under Armour says. But we've been told by people who allegedly know that because the jerseys were made and, and whatever with the logo that they did, that these you could wear the script one or two times if you get special dispensation, for, I guess from Kevin Plank, you wore it twice. But by contract, that, and that contract's going to end soon, but by contract, they only can wear the script helmets one time. Well, I almost think that that makes sense. Meanwhile, I'm the guy on Twitter who's uh, saying, you know, what more will it take for this? But when you think about it, from the Under Armour perspective, from the branding perspective of the school, they went from uh, Terps and the M with the flag banner over it. Love that M flag to banner. the Maryland letters. Well, actually, let's talk about just football when it concerns us. They went from the white Maryland helmet with the Terp script on it. I've got one right over here. To that disastrous period of the Shelmet. Oh, the Shelmet was not good. Uh, well, it looked cool. It looked cool if you held the helmet, but from the yeah, stands. Yeah, okay, it, okay. okay. And the black helmet with just the, the flag stripe the, the, over yeah, there. Yeah, racing stripe down the middle. Yeah. And then, then, and then the Eagles look. Where'd then the Eagles look with the with the banner flag going down the side of it. So like now we're into the Stefan Diggs here. We're skipping all of the Maryland Pride uniform, the L- Pride I, 2.0, the yellow Maryland jersey with the shells on the on the. You have one. Sleeve. One of those is, is in my closet. One. I have a black one with the all yeah. Right. Um, then my, we're into the Pride 2.0, the racing stripe jersey, basically the look they have now with a different helmet and all that stuff. And at one point, you, if you're Under Armour. You got to say, look, you idiots, we're going to switch to this jersey. We're going to cut it down. Make it, we're going to make it simpler. And we're just going to wear it for the next five years. And you know what? Because you people can't make your mind up, and we like to make you all this cool stuff, but you only wear it once. You're signing your name here, and we're turning this back into a respectable thing. This is not our gimmick. We're not, we're not showing off. Now, in that time period, they've come up with some really cool looks. The... 2015 Penn State game. Love that. That's still probably my favorite one. The um, 2017 uh, Indiana game with the yellow jersey and the black. Eh, didn't like that so much. The uh, I mean, it just keeps going on and on and on. The white Maryland 80s look, the red Maryland 80s look. The, so it's not like we've had a shortage of cool stuff. But when you look at the gear that they make, the coolest stuff is – the game against Penn State, they should probably bring that jersey back with the old, old Maryland, like 60s Maryland going on. And that's the one where the white stripes are on the top of the shoulder. Yeah, the white stripes on the shoulder, the yeah. yellow uh, I actually have outline Brad, of the... Yeah. I have Brad Craddock's jersey from that game, at the 15 jersey. I believe it was from that game. Yeah, that is from that game. Yeah. Um, they should probably bring that look back for a game. Not not the yellow. That was that was ugly. But when you look at the stuff they made around it, don't, that's like every Maryland fan wants the Terps hoodie the Maryland with the M with the yellow and the black stripe across it. Like that's, that's Maryland. That, that is Maryland. The, so you, you actually see, because you've been forced to watch this your entire life. Um, you actually see the connection from those teams that were good. And when Maryland was, was putting people the building to that brand and that, that whole feeling skipped this era of jerseys and branding and all of that stuff. It just well, went right well, over it. The thing that, that sticks out the most is there's a two things to me that stick out the most. One is what Scott Van Pelt said the other day, which is every school that's name starts with an M has a giant M as their logo, and we had something that was different. We decided to throw that out. Completely agree with that. The other thing is you walk around the parking lot any given day, football, basketball, volleyball, whatever it is, what does everybody have? The UM with the Maryland in cursive from the 100 years of Maryland basketball that they wore one time. The um, the Terps hoodie that they sell. The Terps hat that they sell with the with the palm on the top of it with the yellow and the... And you're like, that's Maryland. People identify with the Terps. They're the Terps. The Terps play on the Team 980. The Terps on 1057 The Fan. The home of the Terps. It's not the home of Maryland whatever... They have a unique name that's a nickname, and I'm not even a big fan of the word. Ter- like, I don't really like the Terps script. Like, I think that's a stupid name for the jersey. That when I look at it, that's just Maryland football. Yes, that's what Maryland football is. Yep. 
a white helmet like that, a black helmet like that, and that red helmet that's not even really red, that like washed red. Oh, helmet, I love that. Is that is Maryland? That is we're gonna win. We're a top tier team. We have all these NFL quarterbacks. Oh, and if helmet. you look at the pictures and you look at what that was, it was a proud winning football team that actually got it done. They won games and not a disaster of the last 15 years, which has been the worst 15 year stretch in the history of Maryland football. I didn't look at it that way, but I, I think you're onto something there. So you don't think it would lose anything if they just said next year, uh, the the outlier is the white helmet with the red turfs, but the base uniform is the red helmet, white turf script. Well, I'd like to see three of them: the white turf script, the black turf script, and the see, red. See, I'd skip the black black turf script, and I would say that my my ultra secret uniform is the original Maryland Pride jersey with the full size the one they beat Miami with because that look nobody has that look this sort of washed out what they call the Ocean City look that well, they no, use the now. Ocean City looks gone that was the well, Maryland with the yeah but it's still it's still the same top I kind of like the helmet now I, I don't hate it it okay it's different but man the one that people said looked like a flying clown car with the full Maryland flag just just explodes off the screen that is as different as you can be it's better than Oregon Silver. It's better than any crap Minnesota comes up with with the shiny gold. That is the most identifiable uh, alternate uniform you come up with. Fair. Yeah, I could see it that way. I can also see it um, that if they had to have a third look, they brought back like the 60s one or something that like people okay, actually... You can switch it out. You don't need to, to yeah, commit to Yeah, I mean, they have one. all this. Well, I guess they don't because they sold a lot of it, but they have the ability to get all well, of this so stuff. It'll come back. Hey, by the way, this Young Terps podcast is brought to you by Viner Four Gates. We've always said it. We mean it at Viner Four Gates. We make your company work helping businesses with cybersecurity and networking issues. If you need help, give Viner Four Gates a call at 301 251 2900, or you can reach us on the web at oneviner.com. Well, now let's take a look ahead. And man, opportunity is knocking at the door for Maryland football receives votes in the AP poll this week and uh, a game with the Purdue team. That's, of course, what Purdue always is every year. Uh, they almost beat everybody, and they just never win the game in the end. Purdue has more balance over the past couple weeks. Uh, two younger running backs come in. The ground game's been restarted. But, yeah, early on, Aiden O'Connell was running a, a passing circus there that just couldn't hold on to a lead. They had Penn State beat at and that game was at Purdue, couldn't hold on. They go to Syracuse, the game we saw most of, and then were shocked that Purdue couldn't hold on. And sure, they got wins. They beat Florida Atlantic. Big win, though, to go 3-2. and two. They go to Minnesota. Uh, your good counsel guy, which is Ibrahim, yeah. does not play for Minnesota. And you see balance from Purdue offensively, and then you start to see that Purdue can play some defense. Look, Maryland's a, only a four-point favorite as of the this show. Aiden O'Connell, though the guy can throw it, and that's that's the danger to me, is we got another guy that's going to look like Tanner Mordecai from SMU, a guy who could stand back there and throw the ball. Well, no, he's not like Tanner Mordecai from SMU, and that's the problem. He's like 6'4", and he can throw the ball like that, so he's not going to... Okay, I, I didn't mean that the guy looks like him. Well, I, I mean, said he could stand a, back a there, player. but he could stand back there and sling the ball, and we got trouble with that. I think more so than the guy, because if you get hands up, he's big. He can't really move, but he's big. Okay, but he's a game-time decision. Uh, he's been beat up. Yeah. So, ha okay, you watch, you watch he, more of the details of these games than I do, especially it, the out-of-town games. It isn't good up there uh, in West Lafayette at the moment. It's not looking too hot going into this weekend, and I'll tell you why is – if Aiden O'Connell doesn't play or the Aiden O'Connell that played at Minnesota plays, they, they're not scoring. They're not the Purdue that's putting 40 on Maryland next week. We'll see how he progresses over this week. He goes 27 for 40, 199 and two interceptions. That's not really a Purdue quarterback line. The week he didn't play was a disaster for them. They had to get a fumble at the last second to beat FAU, who's not good. No, it's but not, FAU not is sort of an alternate home team for us, but I don't know what they're doing at the moment. No, they got, like, Nikosh Perry's playing there. The guy was playing at Miami for, like, three weeks. Um, interesting situation. FAU never really never really put it together. Bunch of transfers. 
Never really worked. Well, it's the home team of Boca Raton. Um, decent running game at the moment. Decent running game. I'll give you the same breakdown that I gave for the Maryland games. Uh, their game against Minnesota, Purdue, 18 first downs. Minnesota only, only gets 14 first downs. Tanner Morgan threw three picks. Really ugly game. Really, really ugly for Minnesota. Uh, they go four for 14 on third. They don't go for it at all on fourth. Put up 160 rushing yards, which is fairly high for Purdue. Uh, they throw the ball for 199, which I already said. Totals out to 359. They, get, they give up two sacks. They throw two picks. They punt the ball five times. Really big 10 game. Uh, they only fumble it. Uh, they fumble the ball once. They pick up four penalties. They hold the ball for 32 minutes and 22 seconds on the day. So great game played against Minnesota. I don't think it works well against but the, uh, the two young spot. two young running backs, Maccabi and Downing. What's the the other the starters like so, something King? I can't remember his first name. Yeah, I, I don't know either. Uh, seems to have been supplanted by these younger guys, and suddenly, if you're Purdue and you can run the ball in a normal situation, which it's not because the quarterback's beat up. In a normal situation, that's the part of Purdue that's been missing. Well, we're lucky we're not playing them in Hanukkah because they got the Maccabees. <laughs> okay. That, that one's okay. That one's good. Um, look, you got to do what Maryland does. We, we had a segment here a couple of weeks ago and said, look, if the penalties are the right penalties, does Maryland need to be perfect? No, you can have seven, eight penalties. They win a game against Michigan State with nine penalties. So as long as Maryland – finds a way to keep the defense together, and, man, it's looked shaky. Like I said, you rely on three groups of defenders almost to keep the game under control. If you can keep Purdue under control, Maryland, even though they don't throw the ball deep as well as they used to, is still going to put up enough points. And when you said that some points were left on the field against Michigan State, you could have seen 14 more points. That Trader touchdown is a touchdown, and and that Littleton uh, actually you know, punches the ball in from the goal line, all of a sudden you're looking at 41 points. I, I'm still looking at Maryland as a team that can put 40 up. If they got to 40 against Purdue, I'm not shocked. You could win the game 40-21. to 21. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked by that. I really like that guy. I think he wears 37 for Purdue. Name slips to my mind right now. Defensive player, forced to fumble to win against FAU, made some big plays uh, early against Minnesota. I just – Brom is a great coach for Purdue. They win games. They upset teams. Uh, you can never – they have some real bad weeks. They have some really good weeks. They generally lose almost every close game they're in with Brom. Um, he's a good coach for Purdue for a school that's not, not big on football. They sell tickets, but I, I don't think they beat Maryland. Um, I just I, – I, I don't like – their matchup against Maryland. I think their defensive scheme wise, you know, you look at the teams that like to throw the ball a little bit, Penn State being one of them, especially week one before Sean Clifford had to be put back together. He's like Humpty Dumpty of the Big Ten. Um I just think that Maryland too many weapons, too much speed on offense. And then look, say what you will about this defense, but thirteen points they gave up um this week. 27, really, against Michigan. That play where the other team gets the ball on the eight-yard line, you don't really care. 34 against an S, or 27. They give up to SMU, who's going to explode any And we're talking about second halves. SMU, Maryland defense throttles them in the second half. Michigan State has 75 yards in the second half. It's been a really good second half defense. The adjustments that Coach Williams has been making at halftime, you wish he made before the game. But you're starting to see a team that's that's playing better together, and one of the reasons is the halftime adjustments work defensively. Well, I think they're playing better together in the sense also that they're starting to get some push coming up the middle. Like, they're doing a great job of rotating guys in and out. Um, if Aiden O'Connell can't move, I think he's actually might think that he's in trouble uh, against the Terps push. Um, I've got it. Maryland four-and-a-half point favorite. Get out to the CQ if you can. It would be it's supposed to be a good game. Parents weekend coming in. Terps sold uh, upwards now of it's looking like thirty nine and a half thousand so, tickets already. So, so how far in advance am I allowed to talk about? Because I know you just got to win the next game. And if you're coaching it, you're playing it. You just got to win the next. Well, game. Well, we'll give it one minute here. I'll, I'll predict this one, then we can move on to what the okay. outlook is. Um, I've got it. 
Maryland actually scores sometimes on offense. Terps 41, uh, Purdue 27. All right, well, I just gave mine as about 40 to 20. So I, I actually don't remember if I said 41-20, but somewhere around there. So we're seeing this the same. If, it's a, it's a huge if, if you can win this game, Indiana's not looking so hot. You're going to Indiana next week. That's a 3 Are you going? game. If I can figure out how to get there, I will get there. If Maryland beats Purdue, I'm getting to Indiana. Yeah, the 330 it buys you some time there. Yes, it does. Then you get Northwestern, who is not, not very good at the moment. So could you win three more games here in a row and suddenly you're at 7-1 and one and you have an off week? Now, Wisconsin, and I'm probably over my minute now, but Wisconsin just fired their coach yesterday evening. Jim Leonard uh, is supposed to be really, he was a really good safety, and he played for the Ravens, and he was really good when he was at Wisconsin, and he seems to be a guy who you might say was the coach in waiting. I don't know if he can turn this around, but right now Wisconsin's not looking very good. No, and the biggest thing, if you want to look at Wisconsin, is Graham Mertz and, and Brian Allen, the running back, um, both were less than pleased with the administration's actions. Well, we'll see what happens there. Now, you brought up one thing and as we wind down here. Who does Penn State have before they play Maryland? Well, it's a tough road for Penn State coming up. Bye week this week, so, you know, they're probably going to lose. <laughs> but uh, then it's, is it at, it's at Michigan at home against Minnesota or, yeah, it's at Michigan at home against Minnesota and at home against Penn State or Ohio at home State. against Ohio State. And then they play Maryland. And suddenly you can say, you know, Ibrahim's back. I think Michigan's legitimately good. I I'm not sure. I don't think they I, really are. I, I okay. didn't want to think they were, but I watched them this week. They can move the football, especially when that second running back's there. They got some. They can run the football. And maybe uh, Maryland rolls up there. Maryland's hot. They lose one of those games. Their playoff hopes are over. And So it's at, it's at Michigan in this run. Minnesota at home, Happy Valley, Ohio State in Happy Valley, at Indiana, then Maryland. Yeah, I left the Indiana one out. You would think they get the bounce-back win against Indiana, but if Maryland's going up there saying, okay, we got a shot at this, this is it. Like, this if, is if our year. If you're 7-1 and one and you go to Happy Valley against a team that just got their clock cleaned by Ohio State a week or so ago, maybe, maybe it changes things. But my point is that let's say you can win at Happy Valley. You set up a game in College Park. You don't have to win the game. It's just the atmosphere at College Park would have a team that could be 8-1 and one against Ohio State, who would be undefeated at that point. You might actually finally get College Game Day to show up. Yeah, you're probably going to lose the game. Or, yeah, or, probably. Or you're 9-1 and one at that point. You'd have to be 9-1 and one at that point. You have Ohio State and Rutgers left. Um but you always can dream. I just would like to be part of a season. You know, that season that was great in, in my lifetime, we went to the Orange Bowl. Maryland lost to Florida State again that year. So they didn't finish undefeated. And they lost to Florida in the Orange Bowl. It was disappointing. But it was so great to be there. You don't need – this is Maryland. You don't need to win every game. If you lost to Michigan, Ohio State in the season, and you went to a really cool bowl game, it, it's still good enough. I'm just hoping, beyond hope and beyond reason, that we get to that point where College Game Day rolls into College Park on November the 17th? 19th. 19th. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, buy your tickets now, I would say that, is because uh, there's Ohio State fans are buying buying the tickets for that game, knowing that come that time of year, they're one game away from that Michigan game and they're one game away from winning the Big Ten East going to the Big Ten Championship and going to the college football playoff, which is probably where they're going to end up. I mean, you look at what they're doing right now. Trayvon yeah. Henderson's been banged up. Smith and Jigba's not really playing too much this year. And, man, they are good. They're oh, good. man. They are good. And so far, I still think there's three college football teams that are worth watching, Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State. Georgia struck. I don't know who's really that good yet this year, but we'll see. And, well, we've been going for 55 minutes here on the Terps. Uh, thanks to Todd Carton for jumping on, giving us the non-rev report and a look at uh, his experience with the Terrapin Club backstage pass from this last weekend. Check us out on YouTube, Terp Talk, and... And on Twitter, at YoungTerp1. 
I uh, always find a way to snap some clips after the game. Uh, we had Antoine Littleton, 20 seconds that he talked about, just um, you know what he does for this team, how he prepared to get to this moment. We had Corey Deitches uh, after the SMU game, which got a lot of uh, run and love from our players. And then, of course, we have some great in-game content, some touchdown runs uh, from Littleton and Colby McDonald from this last game. And, uh, of course, as always, subscribe, rate, and review. It always helps the podcast, and thanks for listening.